Welcome everyone. Today um, we will talk about um, relativism. Martin Kusch and I will talk about relativism. And in particular, we will talk about relativism regarding science. So relativism is a particular view of how science works and a view of what scientific knowledge is. So I'm talking here to one of the leading experts regarding relativism. Uh, when I talk to Martin, he has not only published extensively on uh, relativism and relativism about science in particular, um, he has um, also led uh, an ERC research project and a re research group connected to the project until very recently, if I'm not mistaken, at the University of Vienna. And um, I would suggest that um, we start our little chat about relativism here by um, picking up a worry um, that is sometimes presented um, against re what against relativism. Yeah? And this is a sort of worry um, one finds in, in different contexts, um, sometimes in academic philosophical debates, and perhaps even more frequently um, in um, various media when uh, relativism is discussed. And the worry is um, that relativism as a view about science undermines science and scientific knowledge. Relativism is somehow detrimental to science. And indeed, I mean, that's not only uh, a worry that people articulate, it's also a worry that you, Martin, have addressed yourself um, most recently in, uh, in a book on relativism in philosophy of science that just came out um, uh, with um, Cambridge University Press. And there you address a very specific version of this worry that relativism undermines science. Um, but we can talk about this specific version later on, but perhaps we can also talk about it here a bit more generally, um, what the worry is and what relativists can make of this worry and respond to it. And um, before we can actually, I think, talk about this worry, relativism undermines science, it is probably a, a very good idea if you tell us a bit more about what relativism actually is, what sort of view that is, um, what relativists claim in general and about science. And perhaps the first question to ask you is, so if we think of relativism as a general view, something that doesn't say anything specific about science, what is relativism? Great, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Alex, for this nice introduction and for your question. Um, before I actually come to answering your question, maybe I lay down a marker concerning this general worry that relativism undermines science, maybe a marker that we will return to repeatedly. And that is just the curious historical aspects that when relativism first became a more acceptable or discussed view in the 19th century, and in particular in the German speaking world, it was often thought that it is precisely science that supports and gives us reason to move in a relativist direction. Um, it was thought that it is science that undermines absolutes and that science pushes us in that direction. But you're quite right, before we can see the, the forcefulness of that idea and how it might work and how it might not work, it's good to have an idea about what relativism actually is. And it's good to notice here right up front is that relativism is a spectrum concept meaning that it covers a wide variety of different views, as so often with isms in philosophy. Also, realism covers many, many different views, or liberalism or communism. All of these philosophical concepts are not one precise doctrine, but a whole range of doctrines. And that also applies to relativism. One way to get a little bit of order in that plurality is to remember that um, when we talk that something is relative, we usually mean that one thing is relative to another thing. One thing, like A, is relative to another thing, 
say B. And now, of course, we can put different things for A and B. And in each case, we get a different version of relativism. So when, for example, for A, you put aesthetic judgments, you get aesthetic relativism. When for A, you put moral judgments or moral sentiments, you get moral relativism. And for A, if, if for A, you put um, claims about whether something is epistemically justified, justified by way of giving us knowledge in the direction of knowledge, well, then you get another form of um, relativism. And so, depending on what you put on A, you get very, very different views about what actually is relative. But also for B, you can put very different things. Sometimes think people have thought that B may be something like a culture, a historical period, um, or a class, or a gender, um, or a scientific research school, or a paradigm, as Kuhn famously called it. So you have many different things you can put for A, and quite a few different things you can put for B. And depending how you combine those two, you get very different relativistic views. But that only gets us so far. We need to know a little bit more in detail what actually are typical commitments that either self-proclaimed relativists like me are actually willing to um, present or commitments that critics of relativism ascribe to the relativist. And here I want to quickly mention five things that are not, not, not particularly difficult um, to understand. The first one is simply to say, and I'm now concentrating on epistemic relativism as an, as an example. Of course, you can put moral or other things however you like, but it's good to run one example through the whole uh, presentation. So the first claim is to say that, well, judgments which say that a belief is well justified or a belief is not well justified, such judgments are relative to something. They vary systematically with something, like, for example, a scientific research school or a scientific paradigm or a historical period. So the first is this variation and dependence claim. Judgments depend upon something like a paradigm or a research school, and they vary from one to another. The second claim picks up on this element of variation and says, in fact, there have been many different such paradigms or research schools or historical periods or cultures. The third claim says that the judgments of these different paradigms, research schools or cultures can actually conflict. They don't just coexist the way in which playing chess coexists with quantum mechanics, but they actually conflict. They give different verdicts to the same question. And fourth, the fourth is an element of, well, how do you get from one culture to another culture? How do you get from one paradigm to another paradigm? And here relativists are committed to saying that such a transition is never forced upon us. There's always a gap, like a leap of faith that one has to engage in if one shifts from one of those paradigms, um, research schools, cultures to another. It's not forced on us by the force of reason to get from one to the other. And the fifth is to say that none of these judgments, none of these paradigms, none of these research schools is ever absolutely true or absolutely correct. In fact, the relativist insists that no sense can be made of the concept of absolute in any of the ways in which some absolutists have thought they, make, they can make sense of it. For example, absolutists sometimes think that certain things everyone has to accept, every rational being has to accept, or certain things are absolutely true because they fit exactly the way the world is. Or certain things are absolutely true because every possible science would end up there. There are many, many other ideas that absolutists have tried to formulate to give content to absolutism. The relativist rejects those ways of trying to make sense of absolutes. So that's, that's like the main elements, the main commitments that the relativist, in my view, should reasonably make. Now, some relativists, however, 
and some critics of relativism add a sixth element. And that sixth element um, I call the equal validity thesis. It's roughly to say that all these different paradigms, all the different research schools are all equally correct or equally incorrect. They're all equal. They're all, all on one par. This form of relativism, it, the critics often have in mind when attacking relativism, um, and they call this silly relativism. Um, and indeed, silly it is. Um, and it's easy to refute relativism if you tie relativism to that assumption of everything is equally, is equally good. That's like the sort of thing that makes opponents of, absolute, of relativism so enraged because they think the relativist attitudes is whatever, doesn't matter what you say, it's all equal. So I don't think the relativist should say that. Final comment, I think it is very important and also very important for our discussion in what follows to clearly distinguish between relativism and skepticism. Those are two views that get often conflated and indeed, historically, they were often conflated, but I think it is important to keep them separate. The relativist says there are no absolutes, there are only things relative to something else in the senses in which I have explained. The skeptic says there is no knowledge, there is no moral knowledge, there is no knowledge in, in a certain realm. The, the skeptic denies knowledge. The relativist defends knowledge, for example, in the epistemic realm, but as something that is relative. Absolutists are of course opposed, are of course opposed to both the relativist and the skeptic. And therefore absolutists are tempted to think that relativism and skepticism is really exactly the same thing. But we will see in our discussion today, I'm sure, especially since we will be discussing science skepticism, that science skepticism and science relativism are not the same thing. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that this distinction or, or keeping apart relativism and skepticism, that this is something we, we will come back to um, later in our discussion. That seems uh, very intuitive and very helpful to, to make this contrast. But let me quickly ask you before we move on kind of um, two questions about what you've said. I mean, you, you've distinguished these um, elements or dimensions of relativism. And um, could you perhaps quickly say, say what, what is the status of these um, elements or dimensions? Are these um, necessary conditions for being a relativist and together they are also sufficient or do they have a completely different status, um, how would you um, characterize the status of these, um, these elements or conditions? Yes, I would say that the core one that has to be present in order for the position to be a relativist position is this assumption that no sense can be made of something being absolute. Um, clearly, if that is not there, then you haven't got a relativist position. Some of the other elements, of course, also an absolutist can, can accept. Also, an absolutist can accept, for example, that judgments are relative to research schools or paradigms. But of course, the absolutist would say, yes, of course, they're relative to them, to them but only one of them ultimately is the correct one or only one of them historically will prove to be the correct one. So the other elements all seem to me to be elements that even though relativists always make these other commitments, they all come together in one relativist bundle the moment once the absolutists, the anti-absolutism is uh, thrown in. I see. And there, there's another sort of um aspect I found quite interesting and striking kind of in your own writings, but also in the work of other uh, relativists. And that is the um, kind of repeated claim that there's a certain virtue of being a relativist, mm -hmm. and namely the virtue of um, uh, expressing a certain kind of tolerance and uh, humility in your worldview if you adopt a relativist uh, position, for instance, about knowledge or justification in the case of your 
the epistemic kind of relativism you um, introduced. Um, so could you say a bit more about what that means, kind of, or why does relativism have this virtue of expressing a particularly um, humble and tolerant worldview and that is perhaps very important if you think about how we should treat knowledge in pluralist uh, democracies. Perhaps that's a, a key virtue of relativism that it fits right into this form of political organization. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that I would say is in fairness to the opponents of relativism, to the absolutists, um, they too can be tolerant and they too can be intellectually humble. So I don't think that the relativists have any monopoly on those kinds of virtues. So I think that is important, important to, to uh, recognize. Um, it's also often thought that tolerance and relativism hang together for the wrong reason. People tip, well, if you think that relativism comes down to saying it's all equally good, if that's what defines relativism, what I call the silly relativism, you might think that you have a straight route to the, to the tolerance, because if everything is equally good, well, you might as well be tolerant of everything. Um, so that, that path to tolerance, of course, would not be open to me since I reject the equal validity view. So I would say that um, even though there is no monopoly the relativist has on these, um, on these virtues, there still is something of a natural, I would say almost like emotional um, uh, roots to the more humble position simply resulting from the fact that you don't think there are any absolutes. You do think that all views ultimately have nothing better than local and contingent causes of credibility. There is no absolute anchoring of, of any belief. And of course, once you recognize that, you also recognize that there are other ways, there may well be other ways, other ways that sometimes actually are as good as your way, your way or better um, to actually make sense of a certain phenomenon. So the relativist is always open to plurality, is always open to there must be other ways of construing the same phenomenon because, well, we all have local causes of credibility and the local causes change, the local causes are different. It doesn't mean that the relativist has to abstain from, from, from judging the other. It's nothing in relativism that forbids the relativist to say, well, I don't think that solution that you're proposing works very well. At least let me explain why by my standards it doesn't work. And then you can have a, have a discussion. So I think there's, and of course, if you believe that in certain realms there can be absolute truths, then of course you will also work towards reaching the place where you have the absolute truth. And once you have the absolute truth, you may not be all that humble about what you have achieved. Where since the relativist does not think there are any absolute truths to be reached, there's always um, the readiness to concede that, of course, one could construe the world in rather a, a, a different way. So I do see some kind of um, link between, um, between the virtue of relativism, or I see humility or tolerance as associated with a relativist view, albeit conceding that an absolutist can be humble and tolerant too. I see. So I, I think we have a, a clear view now of what um, relativists or here in, in your main running example, um, epistemic relativists claim. Um, but I think to kind of finally get to this worry we uh, started with, I think it might be helpful to look at epistemic realism applied to a specific subject area. Uh, and here uh, I of course have in mind um, epistemic relativism about scientific knowledge, so about uh, science. And um, could you perhaps here tell us um, a bit more what, um, what relativists do when they talk about scientific knowledge? What are in your view the kind of extant examples of um, a relativist view in philosophy of science. 
Right. Okay. Um, this is, of course, a big topic. Relativism. Of course. Yeah. I mean, just no, 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 no. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful topic, which is why I, I love, love us to talk about. I just want to warn the listeners that, of course, one can here only mention a few snippets of, of what is a big and exciting um, area. Well, one way in which relativism and the study of science can come together is in a purely methodological way. Um, we might look at the history of science, for example, or we might look at contemporary science, suspending our own scientific beliefs and suspending what today's our best science tells us. And we might try to understand historical phases of science simply on their own terms, without judging them from our perspective. That is a methodological form of relativism, if you like, or a methodological way of suspending um, belief or disbelief um, in trying to understand history and even contemporary science in some cases. And of course, many important historians and sociologists of science do exactly that. So when, when for example, Steve Shapin um, and Simon Schaeffer study the dispute between Thomas Hobbes and Robert Boyle, they don't take a stance on which of the two, who of the two men was right, but they're rather trying to understand which social, political, scientific constellations led Boyle to one view and led Hobbes to quite a different view. So that's, that's the first important um, strand to separate out a methodological type of relativism. But if we want to go further, if we want to get a bit more away from the purely methodological and into the more, if you like, substantive forms of relativism, then it is good to recall the five elements that I mentioned as we started off. Namely that as a relativist about scientific knowledge, we'll of course be interested in emphasizing precisely how scientific judgment is tied to in its criteria and in its methods and methodologies to specific phases and stages and ways of practicing science. And the relativist about science will be fascinated by the sheer plurality and the irreducible plurality of what science actually is. This buzzing world of crisscrossing methodologies, very different techniques, very different ways of, of confirming judgments, um, very different ways of thinking what an experiment is, very different ways of thinking what it is to formulate a scientific theory. So that science, the relativist will be fascinated by that. And the relativist will be doubtful whether that um, buzzing plurality of approaches can be reduced to something like scientific reason, um, can be reduced to one thing that scientific reason is, and all these different methodologies and all these different ways of doing science as being all ultimately motivated by one or um, directed by one and the same stable thing. That's what relativists will, will insist on. Of course, there are also more specific topics that one might pick out. Scientific revolutions is, of course, a, a key topic. And as perhaps many of our um, viewers will, will recall if they had the philosophy of science course in their, in their past or might have learned some other way. Um, Thomas Kuhn's famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions from 1962, was of course a key text in bringing relativistic views to a wider audience of people reflecting on science because at least Kuhn was often read as someone who said that, well, you first have one way of conducting science, then that way of science runs into difficulties. Then there is confusion. People don't know how to carry on. They lose even faith in science itself sometimes. And then comes a new way of conducting science, a new way that initially, from the perspective of the old way of conducting science is completely absurd and crazy. And then eventually more and more people jump ship from the old to the new without that the path from the old to the new can be fully made rationally comprehensible. Um, and of course that seemed to, that sounded to many people like Kuhn was saying, well, there is no way of judging the old compared to the new in particular because Kuhn thought that each 
way of conducting science has its own criteria of conducting science. So you had no stable ideas of what science should be as you shift from the old to the new. So that's, of course, an important inroad for relativist ideas, Kuhn's thinking about scientific revolutions. We still have philosophers working very much in this Kuhnian um, molds, trying to make this analysis of Kuhn more, more sophisticated, but they're also important relativists who reject Kuhn's picture of scientific revolutions and to even reject the idea of scientific revolutions altogether. The important um, relativist sociologist historian of science, Steve Shapin, once started a book about the scientific revolution with the famous sentence, um, quote, there never was a scientific revolution, and this is a book about it, um, end of quote. Um, so, you know, not, not every relativist has to base their relativism about science on the idea of scientific um, revolutions. And as we talk about um, relativism and, and in the study of science, I like to come back to the, to the marker I put down very early on, namely the thoughts that Let's always remember when we think about science and relativism, that relativism came to public awareness less through the work of philosophers and much more through the work of social and natural scientists. It were the natural scientists in the 19th century who saw themselves as once and for all crashing any assumptions about absolutes. It were the biologists like Heckel or von Helmholtz who were these people who were attacking absolutes, or it were economists, or it were historians. And it took philosophers some time to actually pick up on that. And when philosophers picked up on it, most philosophers started attacking the relativism of the scientists. Um, rather than the other way around that like scientists were criticizing the relativism of philosophers, the phenomenon that we have today. A hundred years ago, we had the phenomenon exactly in reverse. And it merits reflecting on why have things changed so, so dramatically in that, in that respect. Yeah. Let me just, just out of curiosity ask, ask two questions about what you've uh, just said. Um, so, I mean, what, one question is, and perhaps some of our viewers also have that question, kind of what makes this focus on scientific revolution so appealing to relativists? I mean, is it just that um, the revolution somehow um, incorporate um, very fundamental disagreements? You can sort of see how people can have very different standards in the background, one tied, tied to the old way of doing science, uh, another has standards um, tied uh, or, or rooted in the emerging new way of doing science. Is that just kind of it, it? These episodes are so interesting because they bring out something um, very clearly um, that can also be found in um, non revolutionary episodes of science. W would you say that is roughly right, or does, does the, the interest for scientific revolutions? Um, on the side of relativists, uh, does it have some other um, cause, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what 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 fascinates people about these episodes is the radicalness of the change. Um, if one I mean, if one thinks about the Copernican revolution, here one can can throw in another important author of of the time who wrote just around the same time as as Thomas Kuhn wrote, namely since I'm talking to you from uh, from uh, Vienna, um, the famous Viennese later English later American philosopher Paul Feyerabend, um, who did a close study of the Copernican revolution, and what fascinated him about it is that it was not just a change in in astronomy, it was also at the same time a change in physics, and it was a change in psychology, and it was a change in epistemology. It was a change in the very criteria by means of which we uh, judge and evaluate scientific work. So there was no criteria of the old view 
by means of which the new view was justifiable. And there were no criteria of the new view by which the old view was justifiable. So you had at the same time a change of scientific theories and a wholesale change of um, the criteria by which we but judge science. And what is more, even by criteria on our theories about how the human mind thinks when it makes such evaluations. And so it seemed like you had like two separate ways of constructing the world, ourselves and the criteria in terms of which we should think. And it seems like such a break uh, brings home that there are no permanent absolute standards by means of which we can evaluate different positions from a neutral perspective. There is, as it were, what, what Firearm takes away from this, there is no neutral perspective over and above the historically changing positions. Um, I don't think Firearm wants to say that the phenomena we find in revolutions we also find in other places. He's really fascinated by this radical shift in that case. But of course, you're quite right to say some other relativists look at these revolutions and say, yeah, sure. And what is happening here on such a large scale, actually on a smaller scale, happens elsewhere as well. And you might say in a certain way, the people who deny the significance of scientific revolutions have gone very much down that path. They looked at the radical changes in scientific revolutions that allegedly occur only there in these periods. And then they show, oh, well, look, these same sort of things happen all the time. Hence, we don't need the revolutions to motivate the relativism. Once we have understood the mechanisms and the absence of the absolute criteria, we recognize that um, revolutions don't have a special privileged um, access to the relativist problematic. Yeah, and the, the other question I had um, about what you said um, before that uh, was your um, observation about um, the emergence of relativism, that this came not from philosophy itself, but quite significantly from the sciences, natural and social sciences. And it's just now a purely kind of sociological question about today's um, relativism debate. So would you say um, this is rather a claim entertained by and discussed by um, philosophers, or is that also still today um, a view that is much discussed in the sciences as well? You mean the relativism? relativism. Yeah, relativism. Well, of course, that depends a little bit on, 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 the, on the sciences in question. Um, I don't think many natural scientists are particularly concerned about it simply because most practicing scientists are not particularly interested in, in philosophical debates. It takes a particular cast of scientists to want to reflect on these more general questions. And I don't think um, many physicists or chemists um, know about these issues more than on the basis of the newspapers or of the newspaper reading, which is all fine because, you know, why should everyone be interested in philosophical questions? Um, so I do think it's primarily a question amongst philosophers and the social scientists. The social scientists, of course, from their very start, have been confronted with radical differences in ways of thinking about the world and judging each other and the world. So they've, they've always been confronted with different moral systems, different ontologies, um, different ways to, to justify um, beliefs and different ways of forming beliefs. So sociologists have never stopped thinking about those issues and anthropologists, whereas in amongst natural scientists, I don't think that is a central preoccupation. And let me also ask um, or pose a, a question that um, um, is no longer connected to that or straightforwardly connected to this uh, previous topic. Um, in uh, a video we recorded um, a while back, uh, we talked about um, this value-free ideal and the question whether um, there is a legitimate role to play for 
so-called non-epistemic values in science. And by non-epistemic, we uh, were referring to a, a mixed bag of um, economic interests, um, religious views, um, political agendas, um, so things like that, that aren't, one might say very briefly and, uh, and in an idealized way, aren't straightforwardly connected to uh, the goal of truth, if that is a, tr uh, a goal of uh, scientific inquiry at all. Um, and um, it seemed to me when reading um, your own work, but also of other relativists, perhaps uh, Fire Ardent, the one you mm -hmm. mentioned, and um, uh, the sociology of scientific knowledge, um, they all have something, uh, including yourself, uh, to say um, about this a role of values um, in science. Um, could you say a bit more about this, what this consists in and what relative, do relativists all have the same attitude towards values in science or do they differ? And where do they differ in their views of the role of non-epistemic values in science? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, this is a, a wonderful question and of course extremely important question and that worries many people when they reflect on, 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 on relativism. Well, the first thing is simply a factual question. Um, do moral, political, economic interests shape science? Um, do they have an influence on scientific theory choice? Do they have an influence on how science is conducted and in which direction science is going? And this straightforward factual questions um, many relativists that are interested in science seek to answer on the basis of the historical records and on the basis of what sociologists tell us about present day science. And here the answer is clear. Yes, there is no denying that social, political, etc. non epistemic questions have a very important role in the history of science. We look at any historical period sociologists or historians will go out and try to show you which social political um, interests or values played a role. Look at, at today's science and they will try to show it there as well. So on the, on the factual questions, relativists are united. Now, of course, then the next question is, what do we do with that factual observation? Of course, we could note that this is how it is and then say, well, this is terrible. We should really get away from this. We should really learn to exclude um, these values um, when we conduct our science. And here, of course, now relativists can, can take different routes. They might say, well, it's not in fact possible to do so, given the sort of creatures we are, those kind of social, political, non-epistemic values will always play a role. But we should try to do everything to, to minimize their role. That's one route the relativist could go. The relativists can also go in a different route and say, well, given that we recognize that social political values always play a role, rather than trying to aim to exclude them, nevertheless, we should instead maybe choose wisely which social political values we want to further. You might say this is still a relativist view because the authors recognize that no, none of these values are absolutely correct, but they still think that we can take the factual results that social political values always play a role and bend it in a direction that gives us some control over which values we actually want to pursue. And some feminist authors with relativist leanings, of course, go down, go down that that path. I mean, in thinking about this more normative question, how should, um, how should a relativism about science interact with question about morality and politics? That, of course, also has the further dimension of having to make us think about how does a relativism about science relate to a relativism in politics or relativism in the moral realm? I mean, to myself, when I've been thinking about this, this issue, the issue became pressing for me in thinking about what would be an appropriate, good, rational way to conduct our decision making about science policy. What kind of science do we want? 
And how do we want scientific concerns interact here with social and political concerns? So what is, what is to my mind, a relativist view in that realm? Well, I see here the relativist as opposed to a kind of um, um, hyper-rationalism. I see a hyper-rationalist view in something like um, Habermas, the German famous philosopher Habermas, or say the American political philosopher John Rawls. Both of them think that we can construct abstract decision-making procedures that every rational person at all times should follow in order to come to a fair and just decision on what we should try to achieve in our society and then what we should try to achieve in our science. I see the, the, I see the relativist as opposed to this hyper-rationalism and the relativist here has to adopt a position, if I'm right, at least that's the way I'm seeing it, uh, a position that I call political contextualism, which is based on the acceptance that all such decisions are in fact always done in the light of local contingent considerations and causes of credibility. And that the construction of these idealized abstract once and for all decision procedures are politically dubious and politically dangerous. Now, in saying that, I want to mention one little twist that often happens here, that when people hear me say that, what I just said. There is historically a certain association between pro being progressive, being on the left, and having very abstract systems of decision-making on the one hand, and on the other hand, emphasizing the contextual and the local and being on the side of conservatism. We can lead this opposition right way back to the time of the French Revolution, when someone like the famous English um, uh, legal scholar and philosopher Burke um, argued against the rationalism of the French Revolution, we should give way to tradition, to local causes of credibility, to context, et cetera. So it isn't, there is an association between focusing on the context and the relative and being politically conservative and emphasizing the universal once and for all rational and being progressive. I think that's a mistake. The way, of course, I cannot argue this here, but the way I see it is that there is something pseudo progressive about these abstract decision-making procedures. And there can be something quite radical and quite progressive about focusing on the local and the contingents and the here and now of our decision-making. Uh, I have the strong urge to ask a lot of questions about this issue, this uh, hyper-rationalism versus um, uh, the political contextualism, but I, I sort of sense that might be the subject for doing another video. It's a very interesting topic, um, but I, I'm, I think we should perhaps um, kind of try to get back to this initial worry um, we, we started with, uh, since now, I mean, we have uh, learned a lot about relativism in general and um, about uh, science in, in particular from you. And that gives us, I think, some basis yeah, to finally um, address this worry that um, some people um, seem to have. And the worry is just to repeat it, um, is that um, there, is, there are, so to speak, uh, bad side effects of relativism. Um, relativism undermines science and it, when I, uh, thought about this uh, sort of worry, um, my immediate feeling was that this worry is a bit too imprecise to really uh, engage with it. And I thought, um, and I just want to suggest to you how one could, um, three different ways of how one could um, try to make this worry more precise to then address it. And um, I'll mention them quickly. Um, you don't have to address them or all of them, perhaps you have your own interpretation that you want to talk about. That's, that's all fine with me. I just want to 
sort of do my part. And um, so I think one way to um, spell out more precisely what it means to say that um, relativism undermines science is a sort of causal claim. That is, if people adopt a relativist attitude, like you described, an attitude you have described um, towards science, then they sort of lose off um, all trust in science. They suddenly begin to be skeptical about science. And now that I put it this way, this probably might lead us back to your helpful distinction between or contrast between a relativist and a skeptical position about science. That's one option. It's a sort of causal claim. So um, it's uh, this sort of ideology leads to distrust in science. Yeah. So let me maybe answer your points one by one and first oh, answer yeah, sure. that and then give you your yeah. answer to the second concern and I try to do that. Okay, so the, the first concern is one one could like sum up in this causal claim relativism causes public distrust in science. So let me say a few sentences on this. Um, the first thing I would want to say here is that public distrust in science is of course a very complex, as you say, social political constellation, very complex phenomenon where the media plays a role and where different uh, players, politicians and play roles. So it's quite a complex phenomenon. And I doubt that we understand this phenomena well enough actually to say that relativism has a particularly pronounced role in there. So to make that to make that worry stick, I think one would have to say a lot more exactly about precisely what is the version of relativism we are talking about? Does this version of relativism actually have a hold on the public? Has the public already accepted it, always already as it were? Or is it something that some players try to infuse into the, into the, into the audience? So that seems to me important. It also seems to me important that, as you yourself just said, um, public distrust is most naturally linked to skepticism, right? I mean, if you, if you trust that um, medicine can help you, well, you are skeptic about medical knowledge. Um, if you are a relativist about medical knowledge and you say, well, there are very different ways to think about the human body, and therefore so maybe very different treatment regimes. It's one sort of regime that, that we have with modern medicine. There was, an, there was also a different regime of, of conducting medicine in other areas. And there are different medical regimes that nowadays, um, um, you know, some tribes in the Amazon have. Um, to say that, it's not yet clear why it would have to undermine your, your, your trust in a certain medical, medical regime. So it's always the question is we, we can agree there is this element of skepticism, but we must be careful not to fall into the trap of thinking, oh yeah, well, if it's not absolutism, then it is relativism and relativism is the same as skepticism and skepticism is distrust in science. Therefore, relativism is really responsible for the distrust in science. There's quite a way from, from a, a form of relativism, which is not silly, to, to a skepticism. Of course, if your view is the silly relativist, which says everything is equally good, or why not, everything is equally bad, well, then it's kind of easy to see how you get from relativism to, to skepticism. If everything is equally bad, well, there's a, then you shouldn't be trusting anything really. But here's of course important to remember that relativism need not be silly. And if the relativism is not silly, then it's not clear to me that one, get that, but that one gets that easily from a relativist view to a skeptical view. So, and I th but I think that there might be other ways of understanding this, um, this worry. And uh, let, let's see um, how one could kind of perhaps respond to, to those from a, from a relativist uh, perspective. Yeah, so a second uh, way of making the relativism undermine science worry um, more precise might perhaps consist in saying um, look, relativism doesn't cause distrust in science, but it can cer it's certainly a sort of um, tool that uh, people with um, bad intentions can use to undermine science. Yeah? So it can be abused to uh, promote distrust in science by whom? Yeah, by different sorts of people, but 
uh, for instance, by populist politicians. It's not that we don't have examples of that, uh, of those politicians, I mean, um, whether they are relativists or not, um, and by science skeptics. So do, do you think this is a sort of more um, plausible version of the worry or what do you I mean? I mean, there's no doubt that relativism um, is sometimes used by um, people hostile to science in order to undermine science. Or let's say maybe not relativism as a whole, but certain relativist motifs um, show up in their arguments. No doubt about that. I would though relat relativize this a bit. Uh, of course, as a relativist, I should relativize it. I would relativize it by emphasizing that these science skeptics, of course, reach for anything that will help them. And if you analyze their argumentation, well, they sometimes use absolutist themes against which they measure science and then try to show, but look, science is not really as reliable as you thought it was. Um, and sometimes they use relativist themes. Um, I mean, they seem to me like the, the, the perfect instance of what in anthropology is sometimes called bricoleur, people who pick up different pieces and stones and stuff and, and build something from it. And it seems to me that these science skeptics are, are just that. They are very convinced of their science skepticism, um, or at least for strategic reasons, they present themselves of being very convinced of them. And then they would simply use any trick and any tool in the book to, to convince the public. Um, and so therefore, um, you know, therefore, do they sometimes abuse relativism? Of course they do. Do they sometimes abuse um, liberalism? Of course they do. Do they sometimes abuse dogmatism or absolutism? Of course they do. Do they sometimes abuse religion? Of course they do. Um, but it would be problematic to, to to be skeptical about all those different strands in our intellectual history on which someone like Trump or someone like Ted Cruz or whatever the names of these people are who, who purport to be skeptical about, about science. Let's also remember that at least some, um, some science critics, I mean, take my call from a previous program we did on, on like the people who are trying to to argue against science by using scientific tools, right? They sometimes use, try to use science against science. Um, and of course, we won't become skeptical about science just because science skeptics sometimes use science in order to undermine science. So I don't see any special affinity. Like if I look over some typical science skeptics um, that I've looked at a little bit more, in a little bit more detail in the last chapter of my of the book that you kindly refer to, and I like refer to some of those, those, those people, it doesn't seem to me that the relativist strand in their argument is actually particularly strong. Like one book that was cited by one person hostile to relativism as like particular, a, uh, particularly based on relativism, I did a careful line by line reading of the book and it turned out that none of the famous relativists was ever mentioned or used in the book. Instead, um, Popper was used 44 times and few people think of Popper as a relativist. So I would say, I don't, I find it hard to count that against, against um, relativism, that it's sometimes used by some of those people in order to undermine science. Yeah, okay, let, let me perhaps present a, a last possibility of, um, unless you can think of others, um, uh, of making this worry uh, more precise. And um, the last one might be, and perhaps that's even the, the sort of strongest way of um, articulating this worry. And that is really, no, no, relativism doesn't cause um, distrust in science. Uh, it's, it's also not such a problem that relativism can be abused. I mean anything can be put to a use that perhaps wasn't intended. Yeah, that's uh, those were the first readings, but perhaps the problem might be that um, you have certain back practices in science. Uh, people forge experimental data, 
or people say it's controversial whether there's climate uh, change as an example of science skepticism, which we already mentioned and talked about now. And um, the problem arising from these bad practices for relativists is, or so the worry goes, um, is relativists don't really have the philosophical, conceptual, epistemological resources to identify what's wrong with these bad practices. Yeah, I mean, the worry seems to be, or oh, that's how I would imagine it. Well, you can always say the science skeptic just has a different set of standards. Um, I have my own standards. Um, what more can we say? Um, this might be a bit of a silly way of this last bit of putting the worry, but um, the, the real worry is um, uh, what critical resources do relativists provide to um, criticize and put the finger on what might be worthy of criticism in these bad practices. Right. Um, good. Um, let's, let's call a study of what is wrong in those practices, let's call that study um, um, critical science, um, critical, critical meta science, um, people that unpick the science skeptics arguments. Let's call that critical meta science. Um, um, I want to say in the first instance that relativism and critical meta science are orthogonal. Um, relativism is a certain view about um, the overall character of our knowledge and our beliefs. It's a very global thesis. Um, relativism as such is not a thesis about what is right or wrong, what are right or wrong ways of conducting experiments. The thesis is simply not pitched at that same level. The same applies to absolutism. If you have an absolutist view simply that argues for the fact that certain things are simply absolutely correct, even though we might not know which, which things they are, um, as you often find people arguing for, for absolutism, like the absolutes, yes, there must be certain things that are absolute, though it will take us a long way to get there. Um, it's not that obvious why such a view would be particularly good at critical meta science. I want to say that um, to, to say, okay, now relativism is only a view if it tells us how to do a fine grained analysis of what is wrong with someone who um, fabricates their data in order to justify a theory. It's just simply to misunderstand the level at which relativism is meant to do some, to do some work. So it seems to me that and this is one thing that's important to emphasize. The second thing that's important to emphasize, and this is the part that you came to towards the end of your question, when, um, when you assimilated the relativist view to the silly relativism view in order to explain the worry about relativism. Because once we think, once we adopt the silly relativist view, which says everything is equally good, well then, then relativism and the critical meta science project are no longer orthogonal. In that case, actually, um, relativism blocks the critical meta science. And we can then, of course, the worry is entirely justified. If relativism equals anything goes, everything is equally good, then it's hard to see how the relativists could forcefully criticize anything. But once we accept that that's not part of the relativist view, well, then you can accept that the relativist can conduct pretty much the same sort of analysis of critical meta science or a criticism of the of the skeptics that also self proclaimed absolutists would would engage in, except, of course, that the absolutist would always insist that oh yeah and there are epistemic standards that are absolute. And either we have already reached them, or in the long term, we will probably reach them. And the relativists say, I don't need that assumption. I can conduct all of my criticism um, to, I think, our satisfaction without having to invoke this further principle down the road. So in that sense, I think, um, no, I mean, as a, as a 
as a relativist, I don't feel constrained in any way or form to be criticizing other moral systems, to be criticizing other forms of aesthetic judgments, to be criticizing um, other forms, um, or to me, unacceptable forms of uh, scientific judgments. And once we recognize that relativism is not silly relativism, it seems to me there is not that much ground left for that, um, for that worry. Yeah, I, I admit I built uh, silly relativism into my question, and uh, that was not good, I guess. Um, uh, with an eye on the clock, I would say we have talked for quite a bit. That was a very interesting conversation on these um, fascinating topics. Thanks very much for it, Martin. Thank to you. Our viewers, thanks very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah. Bye.